Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I on yet? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. There I am. Hi, everyone. It is wonderful to welcome you all to our sixth annual Clean Tech Innovation Awards. Please come on in and find a seat. We have some prime seats right up front. I don't bite on Wednesdays, so come on in. We have an amazing program in store for you tonight. And before I get into that, I just want to take care of a couple of quick housekeeping items. First of all, restrooms are just outside the auditorium where you entered. The AED unit is also outside across from the men's restroom. And if there is a, an emergency, please go back out the way you came in, go to the parking lot and await further instructions. The QR code on your programs, on your printed programs, will lead you to more detailed information about our amazing sponsors, our speakers, and our nominees tonight. So please be sure to take a look at that as well. I am so excited, as I have just said twice backstage, this is my favorite day of the work year, and I am so glad to share that with all of you. I know many of you are familiar with RTCC, and I just want to do a little bit of level setting to get us started. We really are at RTCC an ecosystem builder. We bring together the expertise and the amazing people and stakeholders who are investing in our clean tech future. We serve to facilitate meaningful interactions and engagements between organizations, among individuals, and between our members and opportunities to advance and accelerate clean tech innovation and deployment. To accomplish this, we engage a triple helix model of collaboration that brings together the expertise of industry academia and government to advance our clean tech sector in our state and beyond. We serve as a connector, convener, and strong voice for clean tech. We amplify our members' expertise and thought leadership and serve as an expert resource on clean tech topics and opportunities. We are dedicated to advancing innovative technologies and business models and ensuring that North Carolina has the clean tech workforce we need. RTCC responds to the needs, strengths, and opportunities of the clean tech sector in our state, currently focusing on these three topic areas, clean energy systems, smart utility technologies, and clean transportation. One of the key themes we will dive into this evening is about how we are going to meet our collective ambitious and important decarbonization goals. It will truly take all of us. Embodying our tagline of transformation through collaboration, we'd like to express our gratitude for our amazing sponsors tonight. First, thank you to our platinum sponsors who we will hear from shortly, Hitachi Energy. Thank you also to our wonderful gold sponsors, Duke Energy and Industrial. And thank you to our wonderful silver sponsors, the town of Cary, Trilliant, and Windlift. We are honored to have many RTCC leaders, past and present, here with us today. If you have been on our board or represent any of our current board member organizations, Please rise and be acknowledged for the role you played in bringing us here tonight.
thank all of you and the many who are not here but have been part of our path for your vision and dedication. We're also immensely grateful to our leadership members for their continued support of RTCC. RTCC is at our core a membership organization and our members encompass industry, local governments, academic institutions, service providers, nonprofits, and startups. We have many members with us here today. We've identified you with your ribbons, and we hope to count many more of you as members in the future. Please feel free to reach out to any of our staff and those who are wearing those ribbons during our next networking time to learn more. We have an extremely exciting program for you tonight. Our goal is to leave you both better informed and very inspired. I am already inspired looking out at you all tonight. We'll announce our 2024 award winners. I'll be joined for a fireside chat with our Duke Energy North Carolina president, Kendall Bowman, and we will present two fantastic lightning talks from our colleagues at Novo Nordisk and RTI Innovation Advisors. Our celebration tonight will bring to life our theme that it will truly take all of us and a wide range of solutions and innovations to achieve a clean future together. So to get us started, we are incredibly grateful to our host sponsor, the SAS Institute, who has made it possible for us to gather in this amazing facility tonight. It is my pleasure to welcome Jerry Williams, the SAS Chief Environmental Officer, to the stage to share his welcoming remarks. Good afternoon. I think it's still afternoon. And welcome to SAS and welcome to the 2024 Clean Tech Innovation Awards. Uh, this is our third year of hosting the CIAs and we're honored to do this and uh, you know from my experience it's like it keeps getting better and better each year so Tim I think you kicked it off like uh, year one if I'm not mistaken but uh, looking around the room it's inspiring to see so many leaders from business uh, academia uh, got uh, it's a lot of clean tech folks, a lot of friends that uh, have been in this space for a while. So it's really exciting to, to see folks. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, nonprofits and, uh, you know, a special shout out to my uh, SAS uh, colleagues from AI, IoT, R&D, and a couple of the other de acronym departments that are doing so much with AI data and, uh, you know, the, the kind of showing us the art of what is possible. So I get to work with those folks and it's just kind of it blows my mind. I'm uh, Jerry Williams, Chief Environmental Officer at SAS, and my team runs the, uh, <clears throat> the environmental program. We help uh, develop and execute our sustainable strategies uh, across SAS. And my, my team's role is essentially the, uh, we're, you know, we're the E part of ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance, and we try to make sure we incorporate that stewardship. And, and then uh, we also get to work closely with uh, our facilities folks, data center operations, the uh, uh, property development and other groups to, uh, to uh, vet out numerous clean tech uh, technologies. So it's, uh, that's the fun part of my job. And you know, with the rise of uh, ESG regulations, I'm doing more of the, the document load stuff these days. So that's the less fun part, but I guess it's kind of like a necessary evil. At SAS, we have a long history of operating sustainably and uh, sustainably, and uh, we've gotten a lot of recognition for being early adopters of uh, clean technologies. And some of those uh, investments include uh, solar. Uh, we had the first one megawatt solar farm in the southeastern U.S. that was uh, constructed back in 2008. We've done a lot with uh, EV charging, support for uh, vehicle electrification. We've uh, done a lot with our uh, lead. We uh, do uh, build our buildings to uh, lead uh, uh, best practices. We have uh, 11 lead certified buildings on campus. And we also do a lot with uh, AI sensors and, uh, and streaming data from those and also our building management systems to help us understand how our buildings are operating and helping them do more efficiently. So uh, in fact, uh, we're doing all of those things in the very building you're in tonight, which is Building C. This was the uh, first LEED Platinum building in Wake County back in 2011, is that right? I think so. 
it's been a while. So, and well, like I say, is that each of these uh, clean tech investments are helping us on our net zero journey. This uh, past year, we've, our progress is we're 44 percent down off our 2018 base year, and currently trending to meet uh, all of our science-based targets. Uh, initiative validated uh, targets. So uh, I'm also proud to say that in addition to the uh, uh, using our own software to help manage the program, SAS uh, software is being used uh, with the data secured through AI tech to, uh, to do a lot of really cool stuff, changing the world via collaborations with organizations like NatureServe, which is using AI data to uh, help uh, vet uh, or assess threats for about 7 million known species of plants and animals. The Galapagos Science Center and SAS is, uh, or, and a crowd-driven uh, AI app is uh, being used to help uh, protect endangered sea turtles. And uh, the Amazon Conservation Association is using SAS and some you know, citizen data scientists, you know, using crowd-sourced uh, AI to uh, do early detection of the deforestation in the Amazon with like a 90% uh, 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 guarantee for or 90% accuracy. Today, before I turn things back over to Deb, I wanted to emphasize two really important uh, things related to clean tech and economic development in North Carolina. Number one, our net zero and environmental commitments and progress against those commitments is helping SAS to remain competitive on a global scale, global markets. And I need to stress the competitive part because it's becoming increasingly important for companies to demonstrate their sustainability progress because of all the emerging ESG regulations around the world. 100% of our top 50 customers and probably 95% of our top 200 customers, I haven't looked beyond that because we've ran out, you know, run out of time. You can only look at a couple hundred. But to all have environmental commitments on par or better with what we have at SAS. And, and you know, they're trying to stay ahead of regulations and making sure that they're doing business with suppliers who can help them meet their targets. And essentially, they're looking at us and company suppliers like SAS, they either say, either get on board or get out of the way. Thankfully, we've had a great story to tell and to date, and the clean, that's pro, clean tech progress we're making in North Carolina is helping us stay on course. But uh, we can't get there alone. For effective and meaningful change, it's going to take all of us. Our, uh, at SAS, our clean tech investments to date, combined with the progress Duke Energy has made to uh, help uh, provide uh, cleaner source to electricity, means we're in great shape, shape to meet our near-term goals. However, to get to the next level, 70% reduction and beyond, uh, we're, it means we're going to have to make significant financial investments in clean tech and, and or either pay for offsets down the road. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, we, we need the Duke Energy to continue that process and progress. And we also need clean tech innovations to help us get over that hurdle. It's like the, the part of the, one of the themes that Deb mentioned is we can't do this alone. It's going to take all of us. To sum up the two key points, global pressures to reach net zero combined with the uncertainties of what's going to how that's going to uh, impact us financially is a growing risk for uh, North Carolina businesses. I had an opportunity uh, a few years ago to sit on a, a climate panel with Senator Tom Tillis. And one of the things he said to me really resonated. He said, you know, number one, businesses don't like risk. But he said that when businesses came to him and they talked to him about what he could do for them. He said the trend was he could hear, he was hearing more about climate, but uh, when asked to prioritize it and, and you know, what's the one thing that uh, you needed to uh, need to do for you, climate really didn't make the list. It's like maybe in the top five. So uh, with the, the regulations that are popping up and the, uh, you know, and it's the, the big thing I want to stress is that look, we have to measure up in order for us to keep bringing uh, revenues into North Carolina. To help amplify this increasing concern, SAS and numerous other companies, including Nova Nordisk, uh, Fujifilm, Duke Energy, and others in collaboration with Wake County Economic Development and uh, NC State University have established the Business Sustainability Roundtable. The BSR is aiming to uh, create a unified voice regarding you know, the concerns around climate and emphasizing the economic impact and significance of clean tech development and sustainable placemaking in, uh, in North Carolina. I mean, it truly is going to take all of us, so I, I appreciate your leadership and 
and your participation with RTCC and just being here tonight because, you know, it's just, I mean, it's inspiring when I see all the folks that are, that are involved in this space. So uh, I uh, thank you for being here and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Jerry, for your comments and for hosting us at your beautiful facility this evening. It's great to get some of your thought leadership and perspective on how SAS views the world. <clears throat> I'm Emmett Owens. Um, I'm the ma Senior Manager of Membership and Engagement. Uh, first, on behalf of RTCC, thank you to our awards committee for their thoughtful work, and the, which is comprised of leaders and executives from the clean tech industry industry, academic and public sectors. Um, the committee considered multiple criteria when selecting our finalists and winners. Their job was particularly challenging this year as we had over 60 nominations, our highest number to date. And we are so grateful to all of you who submitted such wonderful people and projects for the committee's cons consideration. And last but not least, I wanna thank you to you, to, <clears throat> I want to thank our many award nominees for their great work and, and, and their efforts. From developing novel technologies to leveraging unique business models to implementing clean tech solutions, this group of nominees has it all. And now it is my pleasure to present the first award of the evening as we recognize our winners. I invite you to, to join us on stage um, using the stairs on the left to accept the award and take a quick photo. And uh, our first award. Our first award recognizes an individual or team that has demonstrated innovation through the development of new technology or by advancing existing technology that has the potential to disrupt traditional industries, create a cleaner planet, and improve the quality of life for people here in North Carolina and around the world. North Carolina is fortunate to be incredibly rich in clean tech entrepreneurial talent. These innovators are tackling everything from AI-enabled energy data Linux at Nimble Energy to carbon-negative building materials at Planted. Our entrepreneurial member, Windlift, has had a banner year advancing their tethered wind capture power generation technology, and later in the program, we'll hear from Nominee Industrial about their groundbreaking work. Among this highly talented group of nominees, RTCC is honored to award the 2024 Clean Tech Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur of the Year Award to DG Matrix. As I share the details, I invite Har Harun Anam, Supashish Bhattacharya, and Michael Wood to join us on stage to accept. DG Matrix is redefining the EV charging microgrid and AI data center markets with revolutionary power electronics technology. The company's core power router technology unlocks seamless integration of multiple energy sources and loads simultaneously with a single power electronics unit that offers unparalleled versatility, efficiency, and size advantages. Congratulations to the entire DG Matrix team. Our next award recognizes an individual or team from industry within an institute of higher education that is pursuing a research-based solution to a pressing clean tech challenge. We once again received an incredible group of research innovation nominees who represent the notion that it will truly take a wide range of solutions to achieve a cleaner future. Nominees include our Entrepreneurship Award winner, DG Matrix, and a previous Cleantech Innovation Award winner, Industrial. And our finalists for their Research Innovation Award include Catherine Polkoff and Hoofprint Biome, whose work is focused on reducing methane from cattle, which accounts for 6% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Hoofprint is developing probiotics and natural enzymes that improve cattle health and digestive efficiency while <clears throat> eliminating methane. We also honor Dr. Win Song Yu and Ken Delaney from the Freedom Systems Center at NC State, whose inventions helped launch the startup NC Solar Inverters. They are creating ultra-reliable, highly efficient, and low-cost inverters that can be applied to EV chargers, energy storage, and hydrogen generators. And the winner of the Clean Tech Research Award is Dr. Benjamin Wiley of Duke University. As I share the details, I invite Dr. Wiley to join us on stage. 
Dr. Benjamin Wiley's work is focused on the reduction of industrial carbon emissions through the production of green hydrogen by splitting water with renewable electricity. More specifically, his research is centered around increasing the productivity of electrolyzers used in green hydrogen. Dr. Wiley's research shows that innovative electrode and electrolyzer designs can boost hydrogen production 50-fold. This breakthrough cuts production costs, making green hydrogen a more viable solution for large-scale industrial decarbonization. Congratulations to Dr. Wiley and Duke University. This year, we are excited to have one of RTCC's Board of Director members, Hitachi Energy, as our platinum sponsor. Hitachi Energy is advancing the world's energy system to be more sustainable, flexible, and secure as they collaborate with customers and partners to, create, to, to enable a sustainable energy future for today's generations and those to come. Tonight, it is my privilege to introduce Kristen Cook, Hitachi Energy's Talent and Learning Leader for the Americas. Kristen will present the Equity and Cleantech Award, followed by a few remarks. Please join me in welcoming Kristen Cook at, and Hitachi Energy. Thanks, Dan. Good. Our Equity and Cleantech Award recognizes an organization or initiative that has demonstrated a strong commitment to equity in the implementation of a cleantech project. As we deploy cleantech solutions, it is essential that we seek to understand and act upon the needs of the communities where we are doing this work and our four nominees are doing just that. Our 2024 nominees included the City of Charlotte's High Energy Use Assistance Program and Solar Equities work to add solar panels to the Peach Apartments in Chapel Hill. Our two finalists, the City of Raleigh's Heat map addressing urban heat and equity through data and community empowerment project, which is combining urban heat and equity data to implement heat mitigation infrastructure and technologies to support residents most impacted by urban heat. And our 2024 winner of the Equity and Clean Tech Award, Maureen Joy Charter School Bus Electrification Project. As I share the details, I invite John Bonnets, a project supporter from North Carolina, to join. Uh, to accept the award. <laughs> Marine Joy Charter in Durham, North Carolina, achieved a historic milestone by becoming one of the nation's first schools to launch a full fleet of electric buses, overcoming unique challenges, meeting codes in a historic district with the supportive partners like Carolina Thomas, Utilities Partners of America, and Duke Energy. This pioneering initiative has not only provided an environmentally sustainable transportation solution, but also emphasized their commitment to health equity for the predominantly minority student body. So congratulations to Maureen Joy Charter School. And please join me in welcoming uh, Kristen Cook from Hitachi Energy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bennett. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you here today. Let's give another warm congratulations to the Marine Joy Charter School Bus Electrification Project. We are proud to have the opportunity to present this year's Equity Award, which aligns perfectly with our mission of advancing a sustainable energy future for all. We could have stopped at advancing a sustainable energy future, but we intentionally had the for all. As some of you may know, Hitachi Energy is a leading provider of technologies, solutions, and services for the energy sector. We offer advanced solutions for the electrical grid in areas like high voltage technology, transmission systems, grid automation solutions, transformers, energy storage, and digital software. We do it all. A key component of our mission is to support the global shift to clean energy systems including helping transition the transportation sector to more sustainable operations through electrification. With our grid emotion fleet solutions, we are focused on the opportunity to support the charging needs of EV fleets, trucks, and buses, which can have an outsized impact on reducing the both carbon emissions and air pollution. I'd also like to take the opportunity to applaud RTCC for their important work in helping to drive the energy transition. 
They share in Hitachi Energy's goal of enabling greater reliance on renewable resources like solar and wind. And our technology helps reduce carbon emissions, improve energy efficiency, and advance sustainability targets. Together, we actively support our stakeholders throughout the industry in reducing their carbon footprints and meeting ambitious net zero goals. For our part, we're also making to work our own technologies more sustainable, like our iconic, eco-efficient SF6 free gas insulation for switchgears, which helps reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Our energy storage solutions help stabilize power fluctuations from renewable energy generation sources, which ensures a more dependable and sustainable power supply. Our high voltage direct current HVDC technology enables clean power transmission over long distances with minimal losses. A great example of our efforts is the Sun Zia transmission project being developed with Pattern Energy. It brings clean, renewable energy from one of the nation's largest wind farms in New Mexico to interconnect with the grid in Arizona, bringing sustainable electricity to millions of Americans. This effort and many others is driven out of our North American headquarters located on Centennial Campus at NC State, putting us at the center of the state's renewable energy R&D ecosystem. We're a major NC uh, and Triangle employer with almost 600 employees in the state, many located in Raleigh. And over the last year, we've hired over 200 new employees in North Carolina alone with no plans to slow down, underscoring the growing demand for skilled talent to support the delivery of large-scale renewable energy infrastructure. Hitachi Energy is looking for all people across genders, cultures, industries, backgrounds to plug into our diverse team to help us achieve our mission of advancing a sustainable energy future for all. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, for your commitment, your passion, and the impact that you all are driving. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. Thank you again, Kristen and Hitachi Energy, for your remarks and for serving as our platinum sponsor this year. I think we're going to have a little bit of a Stage change. Yes, oh, there we go. <laughs> Movie magic in real life. Here we go. So, as we make this quick transition, it is my pleasure to welcome Kendall Bowman, president of Duke Energy North Carolina. We've already heard about some of the important work that Duke Energy is going to need to be doing with SAS and others. Duke Energy North Carolina serves approximately 3.7 million electric retail customers and 786,000 natural gas customers. In addition to Kendall's responsibilities managing this very large territory, she also manages Duke Energy's efforts to engage and work with customers and stakeholders across many topics, including North Carolina's clean energy transition. Please join me in welcoming Kendall Bowman to the stage. Right, so now we get to relax a little bit and have a nice conversation. I should have brought a pillow <laughs> to be able to prop myself up. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Kendall, and for being part of this event. I wanted to begin by offering a few framing comments before we dive into our discussion. So when it comes to our clean energy future, two things are happening simultaneously. We see many important and broad commitments to carbon-free generation from government entities, industry, and power suppliers like Duke Energy. And we see significant load growth coming from a wide range of factors. Economic development, we'll be awarding some economic development uh, initiatives today. Manufacturing and data center investments, population growth in this great state of ours, and electrification of transportation and other sectors, among many others. And I forgot my clicker. Oh, they're doing it for me. Thank you. <laughs> Magic again. The U.S. Energy Information Administration projects that global energy demand will increase by as much as 75% by 2050 while estimates for North Carolina 
and Duke Energy specifically projects a 12% increase in demand by just 2038 as a result of planned and prospective economic development projects. All of this, of course, is overlaid upon a grid that is old and out of date on both a national and state level. The grid hasn't received a significant upgrade in roughly 50 years, and the siting of new transmission lines is a lengthy and challenging process. Given the amount of projected load growth, it is going to truly take an all of the above approach to achieve this transition. And to add more to the complexity, North Carolina and Duke Energy must continue to meet its two guiding principles of providing reliable and affordable electricity for its many customers. So, yeah, simple, all in a day's work. This is a very challenging, very challenging situation and an opportunity for North Carolina to be a leader. Our discussion this evening will tackle some of the complexity and challenges along with some exciting opportunities now and on the horizon. So, let's get started. I'm gonna see. See, this is my. <laughs> so, let's start just by talking about the carbon plan. Can you provide a summary of Duke Energy's carbon plan and any updates for 2024? Sure, Deb. And so, I'm excited to be here with all of you tonight. This is, this is a wonderful event, Deb. Um, so thanks for giving me the opportunity. The timing couldn't be more perfect. We actually just got our second carbon plan order from the North Carolina Utilities Commission uh, on November 2nd. Uh, so, so the timing is, is perfect to provide an update. And I do just want to reiterate, uh, I believe North Carolina is already a leader in this space. Mm -hmm. So. In 2021, the General Assembly in North Carolina passed a bar bipartisan piece of legislation called House Bill 951 that set North Carolina on the path for net zero carbon by 2050. And I believe that piece of legislation has been attracting lots of economic development to the state. I think customers are looking for carbon reduction and sustainability. And I think that that's helping drive all of this great economic growth that we have in North Carolina. You know, I will say that it is gonna be complex. It is gonna take all of us. We're gonna have to be innovative. We're gonna all have to work together. Um, and it is gonna have to be an all of the above approach. We're gonna need all types of resources, demand response programs, energy efficiency programs, you name it. We're gonna need all of that in order to meet this goal. But I will say the order that we got from the Utilities Commission um, puts us on a great path towards that, that goal. Um, they updated and approved the ability for us to connect more solar resources to the system. Mm -hmm. They approved adding some onshore wind as well, some additional battery storage projects out there. They've also asked us to look at new technologies, innovative technologies that we can actually reduce the usage. Mm -hmm. So think demand response programs, energy efficiency programs, other innovative programs. I think we're gonna talk later maybe about power pair mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. programs. So they're encouraging us to do all of that. And we focus on uh, reliability. I think we are gonna need to add some new natural gas resources to the system to ensure that we can keep the lights on as we make that transition out of coal. So in addition to serving all of the great new load that's coming to the state, we're also retiring existing generation. So if you think about it, that's 9,000 megawatts that we're retiring that we have to replace in addition to new generation that we have to build to serve this load that is coming. So it is a, it is a big undertaking. The other thing that the commission did is approved us to continue to work on long lead time resources. And when I say long lead time resources, I'm talking about advanced nuclear, new nuclear, think small modular nuclear reactors or new types of nuclear. Thing. Every day you can read something new in the nuclear space. So giving us that green light to go proceed and work on those. Mm -hmm. The other thing is we are going to be issuing um, first part of next year, 
uh, an advanced request for information to look at offshore wind. So bringing in offshore wind off the coast of North Carolina. So we need to do a lot of work to gather information so we can make the best decision going forward. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting. So we've got kind of the marching orders from the commission over the next several years. But one of the great things about the legislation in 951 that is that we go in every two years to the commission. Mm -hmm. So we can check and adjust. So we can take new inputs that we're receiving. Is load growth continuing to go up mm -hmm. or is it dropping? Or are fuel prices going up, mm -hmm. tax incentives, these types of things. So you can take that all into consideration mm -hmm. as you're looking at the plan for how we're going to serve the needs of North Carolina. So a lot of work ahead of us, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it's exciting and we're looking forward to the opportunity. You know, you've mentioned and, and we've talked a lot about this economic growth opportunity. And I think you know, we are experiencing significant economic growth. There is a lot of good that comes with that. Our population is growing, new data center and manufacturing investments, EV proliferation, these are increasing our energy demand. So how do we, as we are sitting here tonight, how do we ensure North Carolina can take advantage of this economic development growth while also making significant carbon reductions? So the Southeast is growing. I mean, the, the growth is coming from a lot of different sectors, mm -hmm. but it's also coming from a lot of sectors that are very energy intensive. Um, companies that require electricity 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, a lot of manufacturers require that, but if you think about data centers, if you think about artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. I remember when I first started at the company, and I'm dating myself 25 years ago, we would get, we would get excited and have a celebration when we connected 10 megawatts <laughs> of load. Mm -hmm. Now we've got companies coming and they're looking for 1,000 megawatts or one gigawatt of power. And to put that in perspective, our Sharon Harris nuclear facility that on a clear day you can see the steam coming, coming out of the um, cooling tower, that's 1,100 megawatts, that's 1.1 gigawatt. So we have customers coming to North Carolina looking for energy mm -hmm. that is the size of one Sharon Harris nuclear plant. Um, so the, this is amazing. We've not seen this before. So it's great to have. It's great to have in North Carolina, but it's going to present a challenge in terms of how we, how we serve it. Um, so it's really going to require, I think, a balancing act. Mm. Again, I think it's going to take all of us. We're going to have to be innovative. We're going to have to come up with different ways of thinking about things than we ever have before. In order for us to continue to make that great progress on carbon reduction, but also serving this load that's coming. We want North Carolina to be open for business. Uh, so we don't want to say no to this load, but it is going to require us to you know, come up with all kinds of ways to figure out how we can, we can serve that together. You know, it's interesting. We did a program that feels like it's ancient history now about this, uh, the power paradox, right? What the power that comes with AI and and the data analytics and the power required to run that. And actually, one of our speakers, Jason Norman, is going to be speaking about some of that later. So this is very timely. You also referred to balance mm -hmm. and you know, something that Duke Energy needs to do. And, and uh, again, I, I don't envy you, Kendall, because you've got, there is so much already. My mind is spinning. But how do you and how does Duke Energy think about balancing reliability and affordability when you're integrating more renewable uh, energy resources. And, and do you have examples you could share of where these two priorities might conflict and where trade-offs might need to be considered? Yeah, so reliability is kind of the foundational principle mm -hmm. of which, which we build these plans on. I mean, everybody wants to keep their, their lights on and you know, we see what happens when the power goes out mm -hmm. after having gone through, through Hurricane Helene, and so we need to ensure reliability, but we also need to ensure affordability. Again, you want to have North Carolina be attractive for economic development that comes with having competitive electricity rates. So you don't want those rates 
to, to go up. And it's one thing that we've benefited over the years here in North Carolina. Uh, we are below the national average when it comes to our electricity rates. We want to be able to figure out a way mm -hmm. to keep us at below national average going forward, but also being able to ensure we keep the lights on and meeting all of this economic load growth. So there, there's an inherent tension there. And I will say we have to think about it creatively. We have to do a lot of cost benefit Mm -hmm. and cost risk analysis. And I'm gonna give kind of an example of the Hot Springs microgrid. Mm -hmm. So Hot Springs is a small town out in Western North Carolina. And it is served by one radial distribution line that goes through the Pisgah National Forest. And it is, you know, it's very mountainous terrain out there. It's difficult um, to site any kind of a line, a transmission line or distribution line through a national forest. Mm. And they were having some power quality issues because anytime the, you know, a branch blows into a line, your power can flicker. So we got creative and we determined that it was more cost effective to put in a microgrid system at Hot Springs rather than building a whole nother distribution line. It would be expensive and it would be hard to put in place and it would be difficult to get that right of way through the, the national forest. So what we did was we put in some solar panels, we put in some battery backup, mm -hmm. and I am pleased to say that when we had Hurricane Helene blow through, that worked really, really well. Now we weren't able to keep the entire town online, but during the day hours, we were able to kind of keep, keep Main Street, some of those businesses and restaurants going from that microgrid. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not gonna be a perfect fit for every small community out there. It might be cheaper to build a distribution line to serve, mm -hmm. but that's an example of how we're gonna need to be creative mm -hmm. and how you need to balance those costs. Right. Um, so we're thinking through all of those things so that we can balance that reliability and affordability together. Yeah, and we, we have a number of people who will work on microgrids here today, including some of our past and current award winners. So it's nice to call that out. You also mentioned the Power Pair program, and I have gotten some firsthand stories from friends and colleagues who are engaging in that and are excited about it. Can you share a few details and some lessons learned so far? Sure. So, you know, it is, that is a really neat program. And actually, I'm, I want to give credit to the North Carolina Utilities Commission mm. because this was really their idea. Mm. And so we co collaborated with them to kind of come up with this incentive-based, and it's a pilot program, mm. but we're hoping we can get a lot of learnings from it. And so it's a program where customers can get a one-time incentive of up to $9,000 if you put solar on your roof and then you elect to pair it with a battery pack. And so we have some options. I think the most popular one is the Tesla mm -hmm. battery pack. But in exchange for that, the customers will be on a time of use rate and the utility will be able to kind of call on that system when we're having a peak load that can help reduce that peak usage. Mm -hmm. And so if we can get enough of those on the system, it can help us avoid building a peaker plant. Mm -hmm. um, for example, a combustion turbine, because I can call on this battery pack mm -hmm. when we need it most. Um, it's still kind of small, but we do have over 2,400 participants so far. We just launched it this May. Mm -hmm. So it's relatively new, it's pretty exciting. There's still room in there if anybody wants to sign up for the pilot. <laughs> um, it's offered both in Duke Energy Progress and in Duke Energy Carolinas territory. And I will say this is just one of the innovative things that we're looking at. We're looking at coming up with more of these mm -hmm. as we're really trying to achieve that net zero carbon. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. So that really speaks to our residential customers, right? And um, we that is what you're talking about with PowerPair. Um, you have also worked with stakeholders to create program offerings for large businesses and they are looking, we talked a little bit about their own sustainability goals. So can you talk a little bit about what you're hearing from those customers and any programs in that regard? Absolutely, and this is something that we've been hearing for many years is a lot of our large customers 
do have those sustainability goals. Yeah. And you know, while Duke Energy, we're we're working, we've already reduced carbon emissions. We're like at forty something percent, and we're hoping to get there faster. And I think companies like that, and they like seeing us on this path. But maybe we're not moving as fast. Mm -hmm. So they want something else. So what can they do? So several years ago, we created something called the Green Source Advantage Program. And we've just expanded that, and we're now calling it the Green Source Advantage Choice, okay. acronym GSA, um, where this is allows large customers to partner with renewable developers, and they connect it to the grid. And in exchange, they get to count that connection meeting their sustainability goals, mm -hmm. but it also gets to benefit the whole system. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of advancing, adding renewables to the system and it's helping those large companies out. We are also looking at doing, we're hoping to make a filing by the end of this year or next year, it's called Clean Energy Connection mm -hmm. with Utilities Commission. And this is a program that we will be able to do subscription-based community solar. Um, so it'll allow another way maybe for small mm -hmm. commercial businesses or residential customers if you don't own your own home mm -hmm. and you're renting or you're in a condo building but you want, really want to participate in something like this. Mm -hmm. And this is a program that we have been working for several years and it's been a little bit of a challenge to crack this nut so we're kind of excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we're trying to look at other ways uh, to help individuals and companies meet their sustainability goals. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of there are things in motion, more to come. This is, as all good conversations are, a dot, dot, dot conversation. But yeah. before we wrap up, I do want to talk, we, we referred earlier to this electrification of everything. And, and EV charging can be a real um, exciting opportunity as well as a, a challenge in terms of load. So. Fleet electrification has the potential to have the largest impact per mile driven on a greenhouse gas reduction basis in terms of transportation use cases, especially with medium and heavy duty um, trucking. So as EV adoption continues to grow, um, how is Duke Energy navigating this? And are there programs you can share about this? Sure, so I think, you know, the transportation sector produces more carbon now yep. than any other sector. They've, they've exceeded the electricity sector. Yeah, that's not so. a category you want to win. <laughs> um, so, you know, anything we can do, I think, to help mm -hmm. spur uh, electric vehicle adoption is going to be important. Um, you know, we're doing a lot with pilot programs. Um, we've given incentives to customers, if they have an electric vehicle, we've given them some incentives to be able to put the charger mm -hmm. in their home. Mm -hmm. But we're also thinking in terms of fleet electrification. So if, take example, at the airport, at RDU, mm -hmm. if UPS, FedEx, Amazon, they all <laughs> decide tomorrow, I'm gonna electrify every single one of those trucks that, that are coming out from that airport and going out, or either at you know, the warehouses where they, they do their distribution. That cannot happen overnight. Uh, there is going to need to be upgrades to the distribution system. There's gonna to need to be upgrades to the transition, transmission system mm -hmm. in order to accommodate that. It may even require a new substation mm -hmm. to be built. Mm -hmm. So a lot of infrastructure, a lot of planning has to go into that. Mm -hmm. We are, we are doing some pilot programs. We recently did a pilot program in Charlotte with Frito-Lay. Mm. Um, so they want it was like a demonstration project. They wanted to have all of their, their delivery trucks within the bounds of the Charlotte city limits to be electrified. So mm -hmm. we, we partnered with them on that. We're also working at our um, Mount Holly microgrid, which is a fire station mm -hmm. that has its own um, microgrid there. We're partnering with Electrata, Electrata mm -hmm. to do some charging from the microgrid so mm -hmm. people can come and charge either from the grid itself or charge from that microgrid. So we're trying to think of innovative ways to encourage electrification. 
I will say from a generation standpoint, we do build into that carbon plan modeling. Mm -hmm. We are assuming X amount of electric vehicles coming online in the state mm -hmm. um, so that we can plan the resources to accommodate that electrification load. But, but it's an exciting, exciting time. We're also, when you talk about economic growth, you know, we're attracting in North Carolina a lot of the electric vehicle sector. Mm -hmm. You think about mm -hmm. Toyota battery manufacturing, you have Epsilon yeah. down in, in Brunswick County, mm -hmm. and, you know, and all that comes with it. So I feel like we're, North Carolina is just leading, leading the charge here. We're in a great spot. Well, and I think just speaking of being in a great spot, in this room, the brain trust that is here and the innovation that is represented by the people in this room really give me great hope that despite the complexity and the challenge that you all, here is my first charge for the evening, that you all will help solve those challenges. And it is going to take all of us and it's gonna take a whole lot of solutions. This won't be done overnight, but it's gotta be done soon. So please join me in thanking Kendall Bowman for our discussion tonight. And now, as our gold sponsor, we are going to do a little bit more of this and let things disappear behind the magic wall. And I'm gonna ask my colleague Emmett to come out and we are going to recognize our Diversity in Clean Tech Award nominees and winners. Our Diversity in Clean Tech Award recognizes an organization or initiative that has made significant contributions to ensuring the clean tech workforce reflects the people it serves, pursues organizational approaches that are inclusive of a wide range of backgrounds and perspectives, or actively supports employees' sense of belonging within the organization. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have three incredible finalists, including E4 Carolina's Historically Black Colleges and Universities Energy Leadership Pathway, which is preparing students for leadership positions within the energy sector through a blend of coursework, paid internships, networking, and wraparound support. And Old Mainstream Academy's School Bus Electrification Program, which is serving a predominantly Lumbee Native American student population through the acquisition of three electric school buses and two charging stations. Stations, And our 2024 Diversity and Clean Tech winner, the Center for Energy Education, as I share the details, I invite Mozine Lowe to join us and accept the award. The Center, <clears throat> the Center for Energy Education, or C4EE, is a renewable energy education and workforce development nonprofit based in Roanoke Rapids, serving rural counties in Northeast North Carolina. C4EE's primary focus is educating the region about clean energy with the goals of providing stable employment and environmental sustainability. Working side by side with a range of stakeholders, academic, business, industry, workforce associations, and others, C4EE shapes its initiatives through conversations and commitment, fitting the needs of rural, underserved communities while accommodating the challenges of populations which are historically marginalized. Congratulations to the Center for Energy Education. Our next award recognizes a transportation or mobility project that uses innovative clean tech solutions to create positive impacts for the environment, economy, and residents. Our excellent lineup of nominees highlights all the great work taking place across North Carolina to advance clean transportation initiatives. Our first finalist, Adam Power, announced an enhanced charging solution in July 2024 to support scaled EV applications and overcome electrical infrastructure cha challenges, the E100 series. The E100 series complements the existing line of Atom EV level two charging solutions and is built around a solid state Atom switch technology. Our second finalist is a collaborative pilot involving the North Carolina Electric Membership Corporation, Wake Electric Membership Corporation, and the Union Power. 
and additionally WeaveGrid to test and implement WeaveGrid's telematics-based um, managed charging technology. The project has studied the ability of WeaveGrid's platform to manage and optimize EV charging, support innovative EV charging rates, and utilize EVs as an asset to manage the grid in times of emergencies. And the winner of the Cleantech Impact Transportation Award is the Town of Carborough's 2024 Street Resurfacing Project. As I share the details, I invite Max Randall to join us to accept the award. This year, the Town of Carborough Public Works shifted towards an annual pavement management strategy rather than a traditional pavement overlay program. This shift allowed staff to consider the deployment of Pavement Technologies Plus TI solution, which helps extend pavement life while also providing the environmental benefits of smog reduction and urban heat island mitigation. The use of Plus TI on surface streets simultaneously aligns with Carbo's climate action and environmental goals and meets pavement preservation objectives. Please join me in congratulating the town of Carboro. <laughs> Our next award recognizes an organization that has accelerated economic growth in this region or state. Over the past year, North Carolina has welcomed many important investments in the cleantech sector, with everything from EV charging networks to investments to enhance transmission manufacturing assets. This has been another great year for cleantech economic development, including many investments in EV charging and battery storage. And our winner, selected by the North RTCC Board of Directors with guidance from colleagues across North Carolina, is Natron Energy. Natron was unfortunately able to join us this evening. As I share the details, I invite Tammy Zuko, Vice Chair of RTCC's Board of Directors, to join us on stage to accept the award on behalf of Natron. Natron Energy is the only commercial manufacturer of sodium ion batteries in the U.S. In 2024, they announced that they will invest $1.4 billion to establish a sodium ion battery gigafactory in the Kingsboro CSX Select Megasite in Edgecombe County. The project will create more than 1,000 jobs with an annual payroll impact near $77 million. This transformative project is a huge win for eastern North Carolina and will yield dividends for years to come. Congratulations to Natron Energy. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jason Massey, CEO and co-founder of Industrial. Industrial is a gold sponsor of tonight's event and a past winner of our Cleantech Impact Energy Award. Jason will offer a few remarks and help us honor this year's Cleantech Impact Energy Award winner. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, sir. It's good to be here. Um, we were joking earlier um, in a little reception area that industrial is the oldest startup in the RTP area. And before I talk about us, I just wanted to give a nice uh, hat tip to, to Deb and Emmett. Long before we were ever members of RTCC, they were very helpful um, in our growth introductions to the community. Um, so it was a no-brainer for us that after we closed our Series B, co-led by another member, ABB, um, that we were able to join, and not only join, but really step up and, and do things like sponsor events like this. It's super important. Um, we're humbled to be part of, of the, the groups that were nominated earlier. We're a past recipient. Uh, I think it was last year we got an award for um, the work we do with a coincident peak rate schedule um, with uh, a large cold storage facility in Tar Heel, North Carolina that freezes pork. And so a little bit about industrial, we build large uh, industrial energy management systems. While our software is, is installed in different groups, doing textiles, tire recycling, um, our biggest vertical is cold chain. So there's a one in three chance that the food that you're eating, the, the bacon that you're having, the strawberries that you're eating, uh, we're in a cold storage facility that's monitored by our software. So these are large three megawatt sites. Our software and technology has been used to turn them into big three, four megawatt thermal batteries in the grids like Texas ERCOT here in the, the co-ops and munis of North Carolina. 
Um, and so we were hearing earlier about fleet electrification. So one of the, I'd call it pleasant surprises of, of our company is, while we had been focused on supply chain and logistics, it opened up a world where we could actually help in the fleet electrification side. And while we're seeing, you know, slower adoption, and I think we all want it on class eight trucks, um, what we are seeing, and kind of a, a layup, no brainer, is the transportation refrigeration units. All these uh, refrigerated units that are burning diesel, idling while they're sitting at the warehouse, um, while they're sitting at the yard, they can be quickly electrified but we all know that as you're adding more load to the grid, these sites, you could see another 500 megawatt of load that needs to be highly controllable. So our team is back here. I want to give them a hat tip. We are now the largest uh, energy management and digitization solution deployed globally in the cold food supply chain um, from Vietnam to Europe to South America. And we did it from the backyard here in North Carolina. So we're excited to to be a sponsor and, and help with this award. So thanks to the industrial team that joined me tonight. Thank you, Jason, for your comments and support of this event. It's, it really has been great to see your growth and impact here in North Carolina. Um, so the Clean Tech Impact Energy Award recognizes an energy project that applies clean tech to create positive impacts for the environment, economy, and residents. There was a very strong pool of nominations in this category, including Kim Powers Building Electric with Electric Project, Power Secure's Fuel Hydro-Treated Vegetable Oil, and Scribner's Second Generation 620 Electrolyzer Test System. And our finalists, including DG Matrix, who, Matrix, who in partnership with FlexGen, successfully deployed its, a first-of-its-kind advanced EV charging system based on its revolutionary power router technology. Apex Energy's wind, Timber Mill Wind Project in Chowan County, which will have a capacity of 189 megawatts, enough energy to power 47,000 homes. And Sunzia's HVDC project, which will link wind farms in New Mexico to the grid in Arizona to enable the transfer of 3,000 megawatts of clean, renewable wind power. Hitachi Energy executes the Sunzia HVDC mega project from a strategic location in Raleigh, positioning North Carolina as an important contributor to the nation's goal of 100% clean electricity. And the winner of the 2024 Cleantech Impact Energy Award is Project Lightyear by United Therapeutics. As I share the details, I invite Sarah Ellis to join us on stage to accept the award. <clears throat> Known during the design and construction as phase as Project Lightyear, United Therapeutics 55,000 gross square foot good manufacturing practices cold storage warehouse and distribution center is an RTP and serves as a model for corporate sustainability. The fully electric fossil free site includes on-site solar, geothermal wells, and battery backup among other features. This project challenged everyone who worked on it to think differently and this experience will inform new facility development projects for United Therapeutics and across the pharmaceutical industry. Congratulations to United Therapeutics. As I emphasized in my opening remarks, it's clear that to meet our ambitious sustainability and decarbonization goals, it will truly take all of us. We're really getting that theme out there, aren't we? Our last award winner, United Therapeutics, represents how this extends beyond the traditional boundaries of our clean tech ecosystem and how important other industries are in our clean future, including our vibrant North Carolina pharmaceutical industry. Our next, our next speakers, Jeremy Keltner and Nicole Niwa, are here to share the exciting and impactful work they are doing to pursue sustainability at Novo Nordisk. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy and Nicole to the stage. Thank you. Quicker. Good evening. I'm Nicole Niwa, Alliance Development and Social Responsibility, and this is Jeremy Keltner. He's our project manager for industrial symbiosis. 
We're both from Novo Nordisk, and we're here tonight to talk to you about industrial symbiosis. Symbiosis is when two entities join together for a mutually beneficial relationship, often creating financial and economic perks, also environmental perks. Jeremy. Yeah, you might be wondering why there are two people up here. Well, it turns out Nicole and I are also symbiotic. You see, I prefer just thinking, thinking about science and metabolic processes and connecting seemingly unrelated businesses. And I like to talk to anybody <laughs> and inspire them to join us in symbiosis. It's true. I've seen her talk to a brick wall before. And it turns out enough so that it was inspired to talk back. <laughs> Where Jeremy and I sometimes need to see things differently. Jeremy sometimes will see a rotting sweet potato in a field and think, I could take that sweet potato, uh, turn it into an organic byproduct with our pharmaceutical manufacturing, and put them together in a bioenergy facility. And that could create enough methane to power our entire factory. Nicole sees the organic byproduct that comes from that process and thinks, I could send that back to the farmer as a biofertilizer. And that farmer could take that biofertilizer and grow twice as many sweet potatoes as before and give the excess to schools to combat food insecurity. I love sweet potato fries. Who doesn't love sweet potato fries? But sometimes you think a little too big. Oh, you mean like that time that you saw our plastic waste and was like, I could give it to a local company and they could create buttons? And then you said, well, let me just call 100 of my closest manufacturing friends and we could uh, combine our plastic waste with theirs and then the company could make uh, patio furniture we give to every family in Raleigh. That was a great idea. Yeah, but you made me talk to 100 people. No, I gave you the opportunity to talk about ODR plastics and the petrochemical refinery process to 100 people. You love to talk about supplier diversity and resource regeneration. Yes, but you know how strangers make me uncomfortable. It's all for the greater good. <laughs> North Carolina is under, undergoing ex exponential growth, more so than in the last 10 years that I've seen uh, while living here in North Carolina. But with that growth comes a burden on our infrastructure, infrastructure like water and wastewater. A typical process for wastewater is the manufacturer uses it and sends it back to the municipality in a single use lifespan. Symbiosis requires us to rethink that paradigm what does manufacturing look like going forward? How do we coexist together in those resource constraints? And, and can water be used multiple times in a different paradigm? So this model exists in the world. Part of our facilities in Denmark are part of an ecosystem called the Kalimbor Industrial Symbiosis. It's part of 16 companies come together and share resources. Water is used up to six times, saving millions of gallons of water. Jeremy and I are fortunate enough to work for Novo Nordisk, where it's clear expectation and ambition to be carbon neutral, continue to grow as an organization, but do so using fewer finite resources. Across the entire organization, we believe that we have a responsibility to make a difference for our future. So at the end of the day, we hope to make connections, maybe with some of you in the audience here tonight around clean manufacturing. But at the very least, we hope to have inspired you and to pool your resources in a way that expand the scale and scope of your sustainability efforts. This will benefit the community by drawing in new businesses created out of joint need to upcycle collective waste streams. Before we leave today, look around. Who is your compliment? Kind of like me and Jeremy. Jeremy, uh, let's think about this. So how can we join together in a way that will be a symbiotic relationship for our organization. This may take many of you. You may need to grab an extra friend or three in order to make this happen. But I know in this room there's enough innovative minds looking to generate something truly incredible and beneficial for our community and for our environment. We challenge you to start a plan before you leave. But also, Jeremy and I formally invite you to join us in our quest to create symbiosis here in North Carolina. Thank you, and I also have 12 more pages of my water speech. Nicole said I had to redact most of that, but please join me for that journey. No one wants to go on that journey. Yeah.
Well, thank you, Nicole and Jeremy, for this fascinating look into how Novo Nordisk is incorporating clean tech into everything you do. Please join me in thanking them again for sharing their great work and reminding us how other industries are advancing a clean tech future. <clears throat> Our next award recognizes a water, wastewater, or stormwater project that applies clean tech solutions to create positive impacts for the environment, economy, and residents. Our finalists are NC Pure and Process Works. NC Pure is a state-funded project at UNC Chapel Hill that aims to effectively and efficiently remove forever chemicals, also known as PFOS contaminants, from North Carolina waters through the development of highly selective and regenerable novel sorbent materials. NC Pure is increasing PFOS removal capacity and selectivity, enhancing the efficiency of sorbent, enabling sorbent reuse, and removing the most challenging short chain PFOS, all while reducing overall costs. And the winner of the Cleantech Impact Water Award is Process Works, Fat Oils and Grease Recovery and Wastewater Project. As I share the details, I invite Rachel Burton to join us on stage to accept the award. <laughs> the Process Works Fog Recovery and Wastewater Project was designed for and provided to WM for its Fog to Fuel program. This project exemplifies a state-of-the-art clean tech solution by delivering real-world environmental, economic, and community impacts. The Fog to Fuel system can handle up to 60,000 gallons of fog wastewater per day. This solution not only generates biofuel, but also delivers treated wastewater suitable for sewer disposal. This solution ensures optimized waste management and wastewater treatment, enhancing both environmental compliance and operational sustainability. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, congratulations again to ProcessWorks. <clears throat> Next up is our Clean Tech Talent Development Award, which recognizes an organization or initiative which has made a significant contribution to developing talent, providing professional development, or fostering employment opportunities that support the clean tech industry in the region or state. We were thrilled, and it's impressive, to receive eight nominations this year, the most we have ever received in this category. And if you haven't seen the economic development announcements, we need all the talent development we can get. Uh, um, and so it's great to see the diversity of programs, initiatives devoted to ensuring North Carolina has a clean tech workforce needed to meet the needs of this growing sector. The Coastal Studies Institute leads in educational energy programs that support workforce development, K through 12 initiatives, advanced research and community engagement. This team has been instrumental in, in, <clears throat> in elevating North Carolina's Renewable Energy Ocean Energy Program as a national and global leader in advancing marine energy education programming. Next, the EVN Advanced Manufacturing Registered Pre-Apprenticeship Program led by Nash Community College provides a foundational experience for youth and adults alike to gain exposure and credentials in the EV and advanced manufacturing sectors in Northeast North Carolina. And Emotep Academy's year-round STEM enrichment program for middle school students leveraged Hitachi Energy's journey of electricity as a guide to develop adventures and energy program. Students spent a week on NC State's campus performing hands-on experiments that showed how energy shapes our world, designing and testing circuits, <clears throat> measuring the flow of electricity generated, and building their own hydroelectric generators. And the winner of this year's Clean Tech Impact Talent Development Award is the North Carolina Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment Sectorial Partnership, led by the North Carolina Business Committee for Education, also known as NCBEC. So as I share the details, I invite Caroline Sullivan, the Executive Director, to join us on stage and accept the award. <clears throat> NCBCE leveraged a grant from the Siemens Foundation to develop and support the workforce in the EV charging sector. The NCBCE-led EV partnership brought together stakeholders and developed the groundbreaking EVSV field technician training course, providing hands-on experience with EV charging equipment. And this pilot program, which was launched at Wake Tech in June, prepares events, prepares students for the EV, SAE EVSE exam. So congratulations to NBC, excuse me, congratulations to NCBCE and all the participants in the EV sectorial partnership. Our next award 
recognizes a local government that has effectively leveraged resources and partnerships to complete an innovative project or innovative de uh, initiative deploying clean tech solutions to create positive impacts for the environment, economy, and residents. Nominees in the clean tech impact local government category demonstrate the full range of programs, technologies, and solutions that communities in North Carolina are deploying from leveraging EV infrastructure and parking decks to food waste recycling to policy updates. This group really had a wide range of everything. So congratulations to you all. Our finalists include the City of Durham's Fleet Electrification Initiative, which has significantly increased the number of EVs in the city's overall fleet. In the past year, the number of EVs in Durham's fleet surged by 285%, and including, which includes a doubling of EVs in law enforcement. Next is Orange County's Community Climate Action Grant Program, which provides funding to nonprofits with projects that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In fiscal year 2023, the program awarded uh, 50, 550,000 to eight local organizations, including a neighborhood energy resiliency project, which was spearheaded by the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association and provided low cost, no energy efficiency retrofits and upgrades to home in, homes in, in, his, in a historically disadvantaged neighborhood in Carborough. The town of Cary's transforming Cary through, through low raw WAN powered IoT, say that five times fast, <laughs> project deployed a town-wide low raw WAN network using IoT sensors to address urban challenges such as waste, man waste management, environmental monitoring, and operations. Key projects include smart restrooms, temperature and air quality monitoring, trash level sensors, and soil monitoring to enhance sustainability and improve public services. And our winner of the Clean Tech Impact Local Government Award is the City of Charlotte for its Sustainable Facilities Policy Revision Beneficial Electrification. As I share the details, I invite Heather Bullock and Aaron Tauber to join us on stage to accept the award. <clears throat> This project builds on the elements of the 2021 policy with a focus on the way the city constructs new buildings, completes major renovations, and operates and maintains city buildings. The most notable update is in the building decarbonization, which now requires that all new buildings be powered exclusively by electricity, which means no direct combustion of carbon emitting fuels. Congratulations to the city of Charlotte. So this isn't in the script, so he's not going to be expecting it. But can we give Emmett a hand for all of that tongue twisting he did? <laughs> Having had that job in the past, I know it is a very tricky thing. And I, what is the low wall? Uh, I mean, we did practice that, and none of us could get that five times fast. So thank you, Emmett. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jason Norman, Vice President of RTI and Lead of RTI Innovation Advisors, a division focused on helping clients solve their toughest innovation and commercialization challenges. Jason is going to share some thoughts about accelerating clean tech innovation. Thank you. And your clicker is right up there. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I hope you're doing well. OK. So 2050 is the goal that a number of entities are using to set net zero targets. 2050 is 25 years away. 25 years to develop carbon reduction or CO2 reduction technologies and deploy them at scale. Now, as a lot of you know, deploying energy solutions takes time. There's research to be done at the, at the bench level, there's piloting, there's demonstration, and then there's adoption. And so startups and projects often find the constraint that time is their biggest issue. If you think to a project that you may have been involved in or a startup that you may have known that failed, 
would, if it, would it have succeeded had there been more time? Would they have been able to pivot? Would they have had that breakthrough solution that would have enabled their success? So if we can accelerate time or we can do more with time, then perhaps like we can achieve like our, our COT targets. About 10 years ago, um, my group, the RTI Innovation Advisors, which is part of RTI, um, developed a framework for commercialization. We called it the iCanvas. It was based on um, a number of projects over 30 years working with government agencies like NASA, DOE, and others, um, Fortune 100s, and, and startups. Um, and what it did was it broke the, what it does is it breaks the commercialization process into six key areas. There's the strength of the team, technology readiness, intellectual property, development resources, business strategy, and market fit. And in each of those areas, and I'm not expecting you to read the small print, so don't try. If you want this copy, email me at the end and we can send you a copy. But we broke each of these six areas into 10 steps. Those, the canvas itself can be used in different ways. So investors may use it to benchmark where a technology they're looking at currently is in its commercialization process. Um, corporates may use it to, to identify acquisition targets and to see whether they're a good fit with their team and their, their own initiatives. CEOs of startups may use it to um, help prioritize where they're going to deploy the limited resources that they have. With an RTI itself, we use it to track our own innovation, our own projects um, through the commercialization process. Now, before um, I came here and talking with Deb about what I was going to talk about, she asked me initially to talk about strate strategic futuring and road mapping. Um, we have a process called strategic foresighting to try and understand the direction that a sector or a particular component of a sector is headed in. In the energy space, um, like many other spaces, one thing that we are seeing that is going to change everything is artificial intelligence. Now, artificial, there's a lot of hype about artificial intelligence, or AI. It's the golden egg to everybody's omelet, in some cases. Um, but what we decided to do was to say, OK, to what extent can AI help with the process of commercialization? And so with a team of analysts, we went through all of the 60 steps that you can see here and said, OK, can AI augment or help like the individual steps? And if so, to what extent? And we basically ranked it between high, medium, and low. High was over 30% time reduction in concluding that process. Medium was 20 to 30, and low was less than 20. And here's what we found. Every step on that commercialization framework could be augmented in some capacity by AI. Every step. Couple of points. Um, put your hand up, quick lightning talk, lightning survey. Put your hand up if you like reading patents. <laughs> put your hand up if you don't like reading patents. OK, look at that fourth column. Right? There is a lot of assistance coming with regard to intellectual property. Um, if you are a founder and you prefer science over sales, then those, those, those two right columns, business strategy and market fit, like, there's a lot of assistance that is available today to help you in those processes. We aggregated and tried to calculate the net impact for the entire commercialization process and, and tried to determine what percentage time saving we might be able to achieve like with the tools of today. And the number? 25% time reduction. Now think about it. You're running a project, you're part of a startup or some other operation. What would 25% reduction in time to get things done mean to you? What would it mean with regard to funding needs, to market entry and timing, to your revenue model, to your CO2 savings? Aggregate that across this room, across all projects, and if 25% time reduction is, is achievable, then 2050 goals become 2044. Net zero 
could be achieved by 2044. Now I know the logic of what I'm just presenting. There are some flaws there. I know also AI has a CO2 footprint itself. But six years of net zero reduction, like when applied correctly, I think is far better than the cost of the AI um, CO2 emissions to do that reduction. Six years. So that's what's available today. There's a plague of strawberries coming to hit us soon. No, wrong talk. Um, <laughs> what's coming down the road? In about three to six months, there's a project called Codename Strawberry, which is a reasoning model that will sit on top of the large language models that some of you may have been using, ChatGPT as an example. What that does is increase the efficiency, um, it reduces the hallucinations, um, and improves the accuracy of how AI can like, augment um, you know, those requests. Couple that with developments in material science um, capabilities, the application of AI to automated um, research and experimentation, enhanced design and simulation software and capabilities, and you know, AI-powered customer engagement tools to better understand like, the adoption, customer adoption of like, new technologies and solutions. And I think what, what I'm trying to get to is that 25% time reduction today is just the start. This will unfold. These tools will have better, more application to what we're doing. And the time, the potential time reduction will be even greater. So I just want to close by asking you a request for me to you um, to play with these tools, to use them. There are lots of application areas. Experiment, learn, share those learnings. And put to the right use, I think they can help you achieve your goals and they can help us collectively achieve our goals and you know, the goals of reducing CO2, CO2 emissions that are good for the planet and everybody who lives on it. Okay, my name is Jason Norman. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Now I'm not going to sleep tonight thinking about how I can be 25% more efficient. We really appreciate your comments about the pace of innovation and the challenge that you made for all of us. So for those of you who can see our awards table, you'll see that I have the great pleasure of awarding our final award this evening. Our Clean Tech Champion Award recognizes an individual who exemplifies a deep commitment to advancing the clean tech industry in their local community, the Research Triangle region, or statewide. I am pleased to invite and honor this year's award recipient, Tim Fairchild, to the stage. And now I'm going to make him stand up here with me while I read all about him. You're welcome to stay in the middle or come over. But I just, this is a very, very personal award for me because Tim has been so important to my journey here at RTCC and in this community. Tim is the very embodiment of a clean tech champion demonstrated not only through his impressive contributions to the clean tech field, but also his dedication to cultivating the success of others. He has over 40 years of experience in energy, global supply chain, advanced manufacturing, and related fields. He is currently supporting the next generation of clean tech leaders as executive advisor in the Supply Chain Resource Cooperative at North Carolina State University. Tim served in several roles before retiring after more than 20 years at SAS. He is the first reason that we were here, and we are so grateful to him. His roles include Director of SAS's Global Manufacturing Industry Marketing and Global Energy Practices. Prior to SAS, Tim spent over 20 years in the technology industry at IBM, Compaq, Hughes Simulation Systems, and Texas Instruments, and is a proud graduate of the University of Tennessee's Haslam College of Business. I'll say that more important than his resume is his deep passion for this work 
and the people doing it. Tim is one of RTCC's founding directors and represented SAS on our board for nine incredible years. He has also served Serve, he also serves on the Industry Advisory Board of the Energy Production Infrastructure Center, or EPIC, and the External Advisory Board for the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department, both in the William States Lee College of Engineering at UNC Charlotte. Tim is also an active alumnus of the University of Idaho's Energy Executive Course and Summit. Especially significant is that Tim's dedication to these programs and groups has extended well beyond the tenure of his formal engagements. He continues to be one of RTCC's greatest champions and supporters today, including of me personally, and I can't be more grateful. Beyond his deep commitment to his work, Tim is a dedicated community member and all around wonderful human. He currently serves as an advisory board member of the UNC Center for Excellence in Mental Health and will be the first to tell you how you too can support our fellow humans. Tim is a lifelong learner and do leader whose passion brings out the very best in himself and others, myself included. Please join me in congratulating Tim Fairchild as our 2024. <laughs> Many of you know him, and if you don't, please find him outside or he will find you. <laughs> As we conclude our program this evening, I hope that you, like me, are feeling newly informed and incredibly inspired. Our theme this evening, that it will take all of us and a wide variety of innovations and solutions to reach our ambitious goals, has really been evident among our many amazing nominees, finalists, and award winners. Please join me in offering all the people and projects honored tonight one more round of applause. Our theme has also been explored by our wonderful speakers tonight, and I'm grateful to them as well. Kendall Bowman shared the role that Duke Energy will play in our clean energy transition and the challenges faced in reaching ambitious clean energy goals. Nicole Niwa and Jeremy Keltner shared an overview of the exciting journey that Novo Nordisk is pursuing to create sustainable solutions in the resource-intensive pharmaceutical industry. And Jason Norman of RTI Innovation Advisors challenged us to think about how we can compress the future and accelerate the pace of innovation in our own work. Please take these messages with you. And as we move to our networking reception, take what you've heard tonight to continue these conversations, pursue new connections and opportunities, and lean into that tagline that we believe in so strongly. We believe in the transformative power of collaboration, and we look forward to working with all of you to create and implement the solutions we need for a cleaner tomorrow. Thank you, and enjoy the reception.